Hey, this is Mark Patterson with Finding Your Summit Rewind. And this week, we've got an old, actually, the number one guy on the charts, Yogi Roth. He was actually the first podcast I ever did, and I credit my podcast 100% to Yogi. And just wanted to get caught up. Yogi, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm so pumped for you. I mean, I can remember when we just talked about your podcast as an idea and to watch it grow now, and I love checking in with it. And you're going to be doing some mutual friends like John Gordon and his new book recently, and it's some really fun convos. So I guess to start, man, congratulations on the success. Yeah, thank you. I would never have guessed all the blessings that have come my way from starting that podcast. And you have a podcast called Life Without Limits, right? And you've had that thing going now two or three years. You've got a lot of great guests on there, and you've done some amazing things. And you had asked me to be on your podcast. And then as I was talking, the words coming out of my mouth, responding to the questions that you were asking, in my head, the little voice was saying, I think I can do this. I know a lot of people. And so that was number one. And number two is just because of, in the metaphorical sense, I'm climbing all these crazy mountains all over the world, came up with finding your summit and just really about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And really didn't think that much about the name at the time. And it is amazing the feedback I've gotten from so many people about really resonating with them on their own journey of finding their own summit. So, again, I credit you 100%. I always do in terms of you being the inspiration behind cranking this thing out. So I appreciate it. Yeah, well, the thing I often remember about you is the summit and what that word means. And it starts with figuring out why, which you call the seed. And I think athletically minded people and even receivers like ourselves, we have artistic minds because we have to understand timing and spacing and where we fit in certain spots and why we fit there. And if we don't fit to subtly find the other hole in the defense, or the other opportunity in our life as our career ends as a player, it's fun to watch you do that because I think that's where our kinship comes from. All of those extra reps catching the ball and finding our space and our spot and in a podcast world of your voice, to see you 50, 60 plus episodes in now, it's cool because it takes time and it's taken time for me. I knew you were going to crush it, man. I mean, I interviewed you once and I was like, this guy's going to murder it. It's going to be a blast. It's the people. And I know you've got this wide array of folks you are, I'll kind of reset the thing, you are a, a Pac-12 announcer on the football side, and you've done a fantastic job, and so you do interact with a lot of people. You've got these great USC connections. I would have never have imagined the people, the breath. You just mentioned John Gordon. He was out on my podcast a couple of weeks ago. What an inspirational guy. He's a guy that kind of made, turned lemons into lemonade. He was going through a challenging time years ago. And now, like 15 books later or whatever, in public speaking all over the country and world, the guy is the ball of energy to talk to. And speaking from guys like that who have been in prison or are talking to some guys, I mean, this is also a prison. I was talking more about Vietnam, but also some guys that San Quentin, you know, I mean, it just goes, the stories go on and on. No arms or legs, can't hear. And it puts the adversity that I was going through that led me into the mountains into perspective is, hey, maybe my life isn't so bad based on all these other guys. I mean, I'd certainly rather have gone through the stuff I went through than being in that prison stuff for six years. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Doing a podcast, I think, is is really important for people. And I talk to college student-athletes every week as a reference in my career. And what you learn as a broadcaster is that everybody's a story. And you learn that in the locker room when you're around people from different backgrounds, different races, religions, political leans, especially in this era right now, it's really interesting to talk to people. I think that's the biggest issue why you see our country angry at times, is because maybe we're not having conversations, especially uncomfortable ones. And I think podcasts, you know this as the interviewer now, it's a skill set versus being the interviewee, which has been the majority of your life as an athlete. you got to be willing to lead with grace, while asking difficult questions, if you want to yeah. have a unique conversation. That is a skill. Certainly, you have that. I love listening to yours. I just actually just listened to one last week with our mutual buddy, Brett Hughes, and I wanted to kind of lead into that. Obviously, during this football season, you're announcing, you're up and down, you're a very busy guy, and then you've just got this love of travel. So, two questions. So, number one, what is it about travel that you caught that bug? And then the second part of that is, 
of all these spots you've been, is there one place that really sticks out, or is it just a constant search? Great question. Well, I think baseline for me, it took me a long time to figure this out, but my mission is to seek and uncover the humanity in sports around the globe. And for half the year, the around the globe part doesn't necessarily exist because I'm calling major college football games in the Pac-12. But the other half of the year, I add in the back half of that sentence, and I want to go. So I've been doing it now for 15 years, over 30 countries, and they're all pretty much the same in terms of like, I go with one bag and one ball and drop in without a plan and witness the power of play and what it can do through community, through sport, through conversation. And I've been in beautiful cities like Paris with our friend Brett, and I've been in cities that wouldn't go if somebody was paying a ticket to go there. And that's really fun to play that dichotomy between those types of environments. And what you learn is the same thing you witness in the locker room is that a ball, I always like to say, we all seek ball. And there is a power of that, and there's a power of that language. So sport and travel intertwined for me. And the minute I got a taste of seeing the globe, I couldn't stop. And if anybody's traveled, they get what the travel bug can do because you recognize, especially as a jock, that your athlete, or your world is just that. It's your sport. It's your craft. And then you see, oh, my God, like there's a big world out there. Nobody really cares about third and seven at the University of Pittsburgh anymore or USC or, or wherever you're playing. They care about their third, whatever that may be. And I love diving into that. And it's a selfish dive at first because you want to go see something, but what you learn through everybody else's story is that you want to live a selfless life and gain as much knowledge as you can and then give it all away. I believe that is a mission of mine, and I tell young people that all the time, that a goal in life is to give everything you have away, but to give something away, you got to go get it. you got to go seek it. you got to go hunt it down. you got to go chase it. you got to be relentless about it. And that's what travel is for me because I often go to different places to see certain things, and I often always see myself in a different life coming back. So it's a constant gift that is always always feeding my soul. Well, it's such a great bug to have, too, right? I traveled a lot prior to getting into the mountains, but people ask me several times, like, which one's your favorite? So even though I've now summited five of the seven world's highest peaks, I've done Kilimanjaro twice, and I've done Denali twice. So my answer is everyone is unique in its own way just because of the journey and not necessarily the end destination. You've heard that statement many times, of course. But, yeah, it's great to be on top of the highest mountain in North America, Denali, which I was about 12 days ago. But it's all the things that led up to it. It's all the training. We're only talking about the U.S. right now. But also, just Alaska is just such a unique bird. The big, booming metropolis of Anchorage is 350,000 people. Yet, the state itself is like a country. It's just massive. The total amount of population in all of Alaska is 750,000 people. I don't even know what L.A. is, but it's massive. It's millions. Just going down to the Serengeti, being in Russia, being in South America, all these different places, it's such a learning and a growth experience. And at the end of the day, it's something you just said. People are really people. Sometimes it's just the governments that screw it up, but going in and interacting with those people is such a growth experience. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. There's a power to it. I think it's, as education shifts and changes, that remains the truest part of it. And I think that's the positive thing of social media. Instagram has changed the game in terms of people and their ego and personas on a negative front, and that's often talked about. But I look at the other way and say, it's allowed people to see places like Iceland or New Zealand or Anchorage, Alaska or Denali. Like, it allows us to whet our appetite to say, what, that exists? I'm going to go there. And I love that part of it because at our core, I don't care who you are, where you're from, I think we're all seekers. I think it's a trait that can be developed. I think the best quarterbacks are that. I think great leaders are that. But overall, I think we're all trying to get better, whether that's a better life, a partner that makes us a better person, a better job. But we're always seeking answers. And traveling, I think, provides the solitude to dive within yourself to explore those. And then, of course, to see and get around other cultures they can offer you there. Yeah, I really believe that. We talked about the mountains, metaphorically speaking, but literally one of the things that's been probably the best gift in my life, even though I wouldn't have known it at the time, this goes back six years to seven years, is that when I first started climbing these mountains, you can't take your phone, or you can take your phone, but there's no cell coverage, right? So you're up there, and to have that quiet, that space, not too heavy phone blasting away with text messages and emails and all this other stuff that distracts you, it made me really go inward 
to understand the things that I needed to get clear on at the time to see really a path forward. And that has been one of the great blessings of my life. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Man. So, listen, you know, it's been awesome to get caught up. We're going to play your episode from episode podcast number one. You are number one, as I said before. And I'm excited to listen to it and play it to the audience again. So I really appreciate your time, buddy. Yeah, it's just crazy that time flies and we're already in football season. So tune into the Pac-12 Network, man. I can't wait for uh, the fall and get to the game. Awesome. All right, listen, have a great day. And here we go with Yogi Rock. We are here in Venice Beach, California, and I'm so honored to be speaking with a guy who's actually become a friend of mine, Yogi Roth. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to Yogi is because for his age, he's super accomplished. I want to go through that today. He is a Pac-12 announcer. He started producing movies. He's an author. He's got his own podcast going and just very happy to be sitting here in his home recording studio and I can have a nice chat with him and, and really understand the question about Finding Your Summit, which is the name of my podcast. So, Yogi, welcome. Great name, man. Finding Your Summit. I feel like I have a million questions for you, so this is going to be hard for me. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, actually, you know, you and I uh, sat down and you gave me some of the inspiration a couple of weeks ago before I went to Denali. You came down, you interviewed me, and I just had such a great time with it. And I was just like, you know, like Yogi, I know a lot of people out there too, and a lot of people of achievement and accomplishment like you, and why not go after it? And it seems appropriate for what I'm doing, climbing mountains um, around the world and going after things to call it finding your summit. Everybody has a different summit, and I'm, I'm interested in learning about yours today. Beautiful. I, I love the name, and I could see the t-shirts, the hats, I could see the whole business kind of in between, in front of my eyes right now. Let's go back. So as I opened, you know, you're a very accomplished guy and I'm, I'm somewhat envious because I wish I was that accomplished from uh, when I was, and I think not just about the accomplishment, but about the vision, about where you're trying to go. And I think like a lot of things, you don't just fall out of a tree and become yogi, right? You, you are here today because of things that happened to you, you know, growing up. So the first thing I want to do is just kind of establish a base and tell me about where you're from. Tell me about your high school. And I want to focus in from your parents, because I know there's an influence from, from Israel and your, your grandparents and whatnot. And then also, I want to get into, because I actually, I don't know the answer of how the football you know, intertwined into your life and how that came to be. I grew up in Dalton, Pennsylvania. It's a tiny town. So comparison is Think Varsity Blues. You've seen that movie or Friday Night Lights. Sure. Love you it. Know, nothing existed other than high school football. And this is 2,500 people, no stoplights. High school still doesn't have a soccer team. I mean, it's pretty much football through and through in the country north of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And for us, we grew up in a really unique house. Mom was a refugee from uh, the Middle East, as you referenced. Our dad had studied philosophy. They were both in, you know, worked in the therapy community. Our mom was an art therapist. Our dad was a family therapist. So very mental as a household growing up. And then, of course, you added our names to it. And, you know, my name is clearly Yogi. And everyone in our house had a, had a different name. And it was really important for our parents to do that when we, we asked them now. One was an Israeli name, a Hebrew name, and one was an Indian name. And when we were born, it was like, okay, what's going to be his first name? What's going to be his middle name? And for me, it was Yogi is my first name and Zohar is my middle name. And both of them have deep meaning that as I've progressed through my life, I, I, res I resonate with and I lean into. But growing up as a kid, uh, we were forced to play everything from literally in plays as actors, play music, uh, play sports, just be active, be involved. My entire childhood is... A, is a memory of being outside and competing. And to me, I grew up with three other guys and literally we played everything from 7 a.m. until the streetlights came on. And that's where my competitive temperament was built. And it was the one place where no dream was shattered. You know, you'd play basketball and it'd be like, all right, I'm Barkley, I'm Jordan, I'm Pippen, I'm Bird, I'm, I'm Magic. Okay, cool, we're gonna go play tennis. All right, I'm McEnroe, Sampras, Curry, or Chang. Like, you just, you were. And what were you gonna do when you get older? All right, I'm gonna play for the Sixers. Okay, okay, cool. I'll play for the Lakers. Yeah. And no one ever took a shot at that dream in our tiny little town. And the four of us bonded so tightly and, and truly felt like it could happen. That's why I still I still am not comfortable with saying I've done anything because I think I'm just getting warmed up. Like the, the vision was cast so big and broad at such a young age that it doesn't seem like anything's really been accomplished. I enjoy it along the way, but 
to me, it, I'm, I'm just trying to recapture playing basketball as much as possible on the Dalton courts because that's where my competitive temperament was created. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting you actually say that because in Seattle, Washington, where I grew up, I was doing the exact same thing. So we would have been great mates, you know, growing up. I would um, play out uh, different football stars, right, from from USC and other places. You know, college was the big thing for me back then. Uh, growing up, Seattle did not have a team. Seahawks came around, I think, in 1976. So, you know, it's great to play that imagination and dream and dream big. And there's no limits, you know, when you're a kid because nobody's told you you can't actually accomplish what you think you want to go accomplish yet, right? Yeah, well, yeah. And and for me, it was really fun. It was maybe a year or two ago. I called home and I'm like, Mom, you got to read about TikTok Han. This guy's awesome. She goes, Yogi, like, seriously? I've been teaching you about him since you were five. And it reminded me that I was being trained in mindfulness since I was a really young kid, so much so that you know, visioning was it was a big exercise for me. I can remember in high school, I'd lay in my bed the night before a game on a Thursday, and I would envision the game and play it out. And I would never even step on the field in the third quarter, because in my eyes, I already had four touchdowns, the game was over, and I didn't play after halftime. Yeah. And that was such like a deeply rooted memory in my life. But it was because the mental skills were such a big part of our upbringing. And our parents kind of knew what they were doing because of their background in psychology and psychotherapy and all those elements. And, you know, they created... Bill Walsh called it competitive cauldrons. They competed, They created cauldrons in our home. So much mm-hmm. so, for instance, uh, I love to travel now. Yep. You know, it's, one of my, it's probably my favorite thing to do in the world. Yep. We didn't have the means to travel a lot as kids internationally. So our parents would bring foreign exchange students to take our room and live in our home. So that's how I got exposed to East Asia. That's how I got exposed to Russia. It's how I got exposed to Denmark. It's how I got exposed to Israel. It's how I got exposed to South America. Because people would literally come to us. And to me, what I look back at that, I'm like, gosh, I hope I am that forward thinking when I have kids because what a cool example of no excuses. Okay, maybe we can't go to Paris for the summer. We can bring Paris to us. Right. And in our little town, it was very unique because here we were, this left wing, wide open house that's, you know, the sign on our door said, make peace, not war. And in a community that was, you know, pretty much steel working, hands on, just a, just a lunch pail type community. So to have that blend for me, is what shaped my spirit and gave me the the thought that like, I can go do anything, including play college football at the highest of levels. Right. I'm definitely going to come back to this because I think there's a tie-in that um, I want to explore here in a minute. But let's talk about your high school football and then transition that to college. Somehow or another, you got to USC, and I'm not quite sure what that path was. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's a fun one. Uh, we didn't play growing up. So me and those three other guys, we would just you know, we were, we were probably the best athletes in the community, very similar to kind of your, your group, but none of us played tackle football. I don't know if it was a combination of our parents didn't want to do us. The teams were just kind of average. Um, and we would always smoke them in the backyard anyway. So we were like, dude, we don't need to go put the pads on. We'll just play whenever we want. Yeah. Eighth grade came and that's when we played. Looking back on it now, when I talk to parents, like the advice I give, especially now with the concussion element is there's no rush to get your kid into that type of tackle environment. Um, we played then. I came out as a freshman and started varsity day one. And our team was always just kind of the average team. But when our group got going, we just weren't going to accept losing. And and we didn't. And the standard changed and the standard was raised. And we ended up being one of the top teams in the state by the time I left high school. When that happened, I, I understood the recruiting game a little bit. I started to get calls as a freshman from Ivy League schools because my grades were good. And I said, well, what is college? Oh, my gosh, I could play sports in college. Uh, the only lens I saw college through was through a ball. I didn't have a clue about college just from an academic standpoint, as embarrassing as that is to say. I, I don't know what I would have done if a ball wasn't a part of my life. I, I get to my junior year, and I'm playing really well. I think I'm an all-state player, and I really think I could play at the highest of levels. And my dad and I do this road trip that most high school juniors do, and you go camp to camp to camp, and you kind of do the campus tour in the spring. And all I want to do is go to Notre Dame. Like literally that was my life. And yeah. growing up where I grew up it was Penn State or Notre Dame. You didn't yeah. even talk about Pittsburgh. You, you didn't even know really what the Rose Bowl was other than like the cheerleaders you saw on Keith Jackson. Right. Like that was about it. And we went out to Notre Dame's camp and Bob Davis, the coach, Urban Meyer was the receiver coach. And I, and I told Urban the story last summer when I saw him at Ohio State and we got a nice chuckle about it. And they had one scholarship for, t- uh, for one wide receiver and there was two of us up for it. And it was me and a guy, and I love loving him up. His name's Ronnie Rodimer. And Ronnie was 6'5", 230, out of West Virginia. It was next Randy Moss, like looked the part. It was a no-brainer yeah. who you offer. They offer him. And that day I decided I'm going to go to whatever school plays Notre Dame the most. 
I didn't even know anything about Pitt other than I knew their depth chart at receiver. The receiver coach was a former walk-on. I thought I could do it. And I knew the scholarship guys coming in. And I thought I was just as good as he was. And I decided to walk on at Pitt. Uh, got really lucky. And I uh, started, I came in early. I did all the little things and played in, I think, my second game as a freshman. And I, and I tell you that story because when I was a senior in high school, I came home one day and I said, Mom, I'm pretty pumped. And I gave her this award. And I was named like, I think it was Defensive Player of the Year in Pennsylvania. And she goes, Yogi, congratulations. But there's 49 other states. Yeah. And that was like a great reminder to me of like, you're in this small town and it matters, but there is a big world. And the only rule we had in our home is when you turn 18, you have to leave. You had to get out. You weren't allowed to stick around in our town. You had to see the globe. Yeah. You had to see the world. So I went to Pitt, walked on and just started fighting. And that fight that you know as an athlete in college and regardless of what level, the fight's the same because your passion and love is tested. And you either love it and you thrive or you don't and you falter and you don't care. And I really think it's that easy in college athletics, especially especially at the highest of levels. Got lucky, played, got a scally, um, kind of had that type of fourth, fifth wide receiver type career. Um, and at the time, Pete Carroll's son, Brennan, was one of my best friends and mentors in college. He was mm-hmm. our tight end. And when he left early uh, you know, to graduate, he was older than me. He went and GA'd at SC. I came to SC in the summers and just started to see like, whoa, California. This is awesome. Coach Carroll so, and I So vibe. this is after your fourth year? This is after my third year. I think I go out on spring break and I'm like, I remember calling my mom from Manhattan Beach and I was like, mom, um, no offense, but why didn't we grow up here? <laughs> <laughs> and she's, she had never been west of All right. Ohio, let alone the Mississippi. Common common response when you hit Manhattan Beach. <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah. So it was over for me. I, I, had to, I was going to find a way out here. Yeah. So you're done now playing football. Yeah. I finish. Uh, I, pl- I have one more year. I play at Pitt. I finished my senior year and then I actually go to Australia and play there. Okay. And I wasn't ready to say goodbye. And I was kind of lost in my life like all of us are when the game says it's done with us. Yeah. I didn't really know what to do, how to adjust. And Australia thankfully gave me like that kind of cushion of a, of a nice fall and me just kind of having that identity crisis of who I am, what am I about. And, and I'd known Pete, I knew SC, I knew Sark and Kiff and the whole staff and we were all, you know, boys and it was great, but... In my mind, I was never going to coach. Like, I saw what they did. My receiver coach in college saw his wife on Sundays from 4 to 5 p.m., and that yeah. was it in the season. I mean, it was grinding. He never saw his kids. And it just wasn't – I didn't have a family or anything, but I just didn't vision cast that for my life. So I went to Australia, played. So um, you're, are you a professional now? Yeah, I'm a professional athlete. So you're getting paid, what, no, 100 bucks? No, you're getting paid like a couple beers. And, yeah, yeah, right. And it was great because our quarterback was – 50 and our center was 18 <laughs> and nobody was good and like you have to remember like my roommates in college were antonio bryant who was a blitnikoff winner yeah. all-american and larry fitzgerald a blitnikoff winner yeah. all-american it's, i i was never that guy i went to australia and i became that guy I mean, yeah. no one was very good so it was a great way to you could dominate in dominate, a new space yeah have fun just really get back to the play of the game which sometimes we can get lost in you know and, and, and the one thing that's great about australia and i've been there a number of times and the people are so warm and friendly and they just seem to have uh, I, I made this jokingly to one of my climbing partners who lives there in melbourne um right now and they remind me and i mean this in all the positive sense of a chocolate lab because they just their demeanor is just happy always kind of wagging their tail everything is great and no worries yeah that's where, and you're exactly right. I, I always describe it as everyone makes 50 grand, has a crappy car and loves life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it is, it to me was a great uh, lens to see the world. And I literally, this is pathetic, but I thought when we landed, I was going to see kangaroos and koala bears jumping yeah. down the, jumping down the street and they have freeways and highways and towns and just to finally travel and see it. And I traveled everywhere. I played, I had this job at uh, an internet cafe at the local mall. I took the bus to and from work. I lived with seven people, two females, five guys. Everybody didn't have a room or a bed. We just figured it out. And uh, it was awesome. I I say that that's when I became obsessed with traveling. I went to Bali, I'd surf, I'd travel all over Australia. That's when the bug got me of, whoa, whoa, sports, power of play can do what? Oh my gosh, we all do speak ball and I can go to a different community and all of a sudden I can connect with people over whether it's rugby, soccer, football, bat, whatever. Wow. Can sport be a way that I can see the world? And that's when it started to get supplanted deep, deep in my subconscious of, I think so. You know, maybe someday I could. So now, okay. So, you know, you know, Australia and your, your mind is being expanded, so to speak. And so did you end up then going to SC 
as a graduate assistant or where did that come in or didn't come in? Yeah. So actually when I was in Australia, I got a job outside of the internet cafe and I was going to stick around. I was in, I had a job, I was dating somebody like life was good in Australia. And the one job I wanted, I got offered, which was to do radio for the Pittsburgh Panthers radio sideline network, which was like Fox clear channel, something like that. Mm. And, uh, and I took it and I went back to Pittsburgh and, uh, and prior to going back to Pittsburgh, I went home and broke like the cardinal rule. I went home for two weeks and hated it so much so that I ended up calling one of those three guys that I played basketball with growing up. And I said, how much money do you have? And he says, I have 1500 bucks. He goes, how much do you have? I said, I have 1500 bucks. We took our three grand and drove across the country for a month and slept in the car pretty much every night because mm-hmm. I just had to keep seeking and keep exploring and keep growing simultaneously. I think I got offered like the receiver job at Akron. Like I had a couple of things that popped in college football. So I was always getting pulled to teams, but I was like, no, I need to go down this road of media. Ended up moving to Pittsburgh, do TV for a year and radio um, or for a football season, do half a basketball season. And SC wins the national championship for the second time. Um, they smoked somebody. I think it was probably Oklahoma. And Pete called me at midnight, uh, my time. And he goes, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, n- nothing. What's up, man? And he goes, uh, I think I got something for you. Uh, why don't you call me tomorrow? And I said, okay. And of course, I can't sleep. And I'm thinking to myself, right. like, when do I call him? He's like, not too early, but just call me. Yeah. I'm like, w- w- when do I call? How do I call? And I, remember, I remember it like yesterday, man. So I drive to this hill in Pittsburgh because service was a little spotty on my phone. And I was like, I'm going to go to the highest peak yeah. to make sure this call doesn't drop. And I'm about to call like the guy, you know, this is Pete freaking Carol I'm calling. And uh, I call him. And of course, it's too early. I call him at like nine and he was still, I think he was still sleeping. And he goes, uh, yeah, I'm up, man. What's up? Let's, let's talk about it. And it was like a five minute talk of what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to impact the world in a really cool way. Yeah. And that's what I told him when I first met him two years prior. And that's what I've always kind of has been kind of my thesis statement in life. And he goes, well, why don't you come out here and have some fun? And I said, all right, I don't want to coach but I want to go to grad school, but I'll do anything you want. He said, sure, no worries. We'll get you to grad school and uh, you're going to work uh, on player personnel. Basically, like director of football operations was going to get split down the middle. I was going to do logistic. I would do like the football, meet with the NFL guys, kind of be that role. Right. And uh, I move out two weeks later and uh, I drop into Hermosa Beach and I go to SC. I take the job and the guy whose job that they gave me is now the athletic director of Villanova. His name was Mark Jackson. He was leaving for a job at Syracuse. I slide in two weeks into it. He sits me down just like this over a burrito on his little couch in his office. And he goes, do you want to coach? And I didn't flinch. And I said, sure, let's roll. Wow. And that's how I got into coaching. And I was kind of the grunt for Lane and Sark for two years. I slept in the office every night for the most part. I went to grad school, got my master's. And that's when Pete and I connected the most because he was sleeping in the office a, a couple nights as well. So let me ask you this, because the math to me does not pencil here. So number one, you have no experience broadcasting, but you get a, you get offered a job to broadcast with the Pittsburgh Panthers. Yeah. And then the second part of that is now you've never coached, but they're asking you to to, to be assistant coach. Yeah, I know. It's interesting. So but how, I, how does I, that work? So I think there's two, two reasons. And I tell this to college uh, students all the time, like even when I met your daughter of when I was in college, Every Friday, the TV trucks come in and meet with the coaches. Like the Kirk Herb Streets meet with, at the time, Walt Harris right. and Larry Fitzgerald and the coordinators. Well, I started to see that and I was like, can I sit in on those meetings? And I started to sit in on the production meetings. And then they would look at me and be like, he's the smart guy, probably. Let me ask him about the game plan. So we saw her develop these relationships I did with broadcasters and producers of they knew what they needed from me. I didn't care. But I knew what I needed from them, which was an email or a relationship. And it just started to happen. And I started to say, whoa, Herbie, like that's a job. And our careers are kind of similar as players. He wasn't a Hall of Famer. I'm not a Hall of Famer. Right. What a cool job. And so I just kept those relationships going throughout. In coaching, I had always been the coach on the field. I was the guy who I sat in quarterback meetings because I needed to think like that. You know, they sent me my roommates and Antonio and Larry because they wanted me to coach them. So I was always kind of that role. And then when I met Pete a couple years prior, when I went out on spring break, we just had this kindred spirit relationship of seeking the world. We were both kind of undersized chip on the shoulder type guys. Yeah. And you always need somebody. I always say somebody has to give everybody a break. And uh, they kind of gave me that chance. They knew I'd come in and bust my ass and, and do that. And, and in his philosophy, it was, I'll teach you how to coach. You know, I, he doesn't necessarily want guys that come in, especially young guys that have been trained by five different people. He wants you to have the clay and the ability to to receive all the knowledge and just go to work. And and I was I was going to be that. And for us, it was uh, 
you know, it was the start of what he took, how my parents developed me. He took that clay and molded it. And to this day, I'll say that my 20s being around him was the greatest gift of my life. So where then was that separation, right? So now you're, you've got really two parallel paths going. You've got this coaching thing that, yeah. that you know, Pete Carroll has offered you. At the time, he was the, the coach in, in college football. SC was a machine for 10 years. And then you've also got this interest in broadcasting. And so um, for you, now you've, you, you, at some point in time, you took a big leap and, you know, went all in and you are now one of the lead Pac-12 announcers for, of course, the Pac-12 and um, you're not coaching. Yeah. So where, you know, at some point in time, there's you either go left or you go right. Yeah, it was hard. I've always struggled with that in everything. You know, I always have stated that I, I, I'm a guy who wants life experiences you know, I don't necessarily want to do something for, you know, 30 years. And at the time, that's how I felt about coaching. You got to, like, as we piece it together, when I was coaching, Pete had me doing everything, you know, and not only was I coaching and, you know, my first two years, I was the grunt. I went out with Lane for like a day to the Raiders, came back. He let me coach the quarterback. So now I have like a real job and I'm really doing meetings and doing real football. But throughout it, we would meet at night and he would say, hey, what do you want to do? Let's let's create some stuff. Okay, cool. We're doing great. And we had this circle on this big whiteboard in the middle. It had Win Forever, which was kind of his brand. And uh, what should we do? Oh, let's, let's see if we can create a peace rally in Los Angeles. Yo, what do you think? Yeah, I'll figure it out. We created a peace rally in Los Angeles. You know, at the time, there's a lot of gang violence going on. And Pete was in the middle of it trying to just have some sort of impact positively to slow down or stop it. Let's see if we can uh, do a movie. All right, let's see if we can do a documentary. Yo, figure it out. We were literally like so close to an IMAX movie in college football. It was awesome. Like it got right down to the final wire. It was, hey, let's write a book. Cool. We wrote a book. You know, so I was just around this really creative guy and I was kind of the, you know, the person that would kind of figure it out, you know, so I got exposed to a lot. And even when I went to coach, in my mind, I was always like, I'm going to get my PhD in football. Like, because right now ESPN's not hiring me because of my pit playing career. And it would have been a nice, hard trajectory like it is for anybody. But where can I jump and leapfrog the competition? Well, nobody's going to be able to see the game like I can see it. I'm going to learn from the best as your reference. Offensive football, I feel like I got my master's degree in from Lane and Sark at the time. And then overall, philosophically organizing a culture, I wrote his book. You know, So I got to really get into the nuts and bolts of it. So I was ready either way. And every year when you were at SC at that time, People were, uh, you know, you were approached about other jobs mm -hmm. and I was never going to leave. I can remember I had a chance to go to a really cool school in the SEC and I said, nope, because I'm not ready. I'm not done with learning from this guy. Like I knew how special Pete was mm -hmm. and I wanted to soak up all of that. And four years into it, that's when I was like, okay, it's time for me to go. Like that was, that was the end of the run. And I looked at him and I looked at Pat Rule. He was the O-line coach. And these guys had coached together since they were at Arkansas under Lou Holtz. And I said, you guys have been doing this for 35 years at the time. And that's awesome. But I cannot uh, stomach the idea of doing the same thing for 35 years. I was like, I got to see the world. And I wanted to travel. And I needed to get out. Mm -hmm. And not just for 10 days on a spring break. Like, I needed to get out. And I had a chance to go to Washington, be the full-time QB coach with Sark, your alma mater. Yeah. And uh, it was the hardest thing to do because he's family to me. And I turned it down and I was like, I got to I gotta listen to my truth. And I got on a plane on a one-way ticket and flew to uh, Easter Island and just started traveling and just was lost in a disaster. And it was just like, screw it. I got I to gotta seek who I am versus go down this path as a coach where you know literally when you can go to the bathroom, let alone what practice is like. Your schedule is so mapped out that at 26, I just wasn't comfortable with doing that. Yeah. I think that takes a lot of courage and balls to, you know, step out. And so often, so many people are going down the path of sure things and probability and um, security, right? And you are really under the umbrella of a lot of what would become a number of uh, potential head coaches in college in, in the NFL, not to mention or leave out Pete Carroll, who, you know, who's done obviously extremely well with the Seattle Seahawks is, is, is at the same time. So I don't know. I mean, I, th I think it gets back to what I call my podcast, which is Finding Your Summit. And I don't think there's any one summit. You know, I look back on my life and it depends on the period of your life that you're going through that you seek different summits, right? So there's a period in time when maybe coaching, you thought that that was your, that was your place and you, you wanted to ascend to the top of the profession, you know, and that might've been your summit and then your summit changed. You know, you grew things happen and you want to go out and you want to travel and then you bounce into broadcasting, right? So I think you've been hooked up and you've been paired with one of the, the, the top guys, right? Ted Ever. Robinson. Yeah. Ted Robinson. 
Um, I listened to your podcast with him. It was really fascinating with his experience. But what a wonderful, humble guy to turn around and take you under his wing and really, you know, share the the, the stage with you in the sense of, of broadcasting this new network. It's been awesome. I mean, I always say that I've been gifted some really amazing people in life, you know, really like each each step of the way. You know, I don't get into TV unless one of those guys who I sat in a production meeting with takes a run at me on College Football Live nine years ago. I'll never forget it. He goes, tell me about Matt Barkley. His name was Michael Fountain or is Michael Fountain. And I said, I'll tell you all about him. Put me on TV. And he goes, you've never done it before. And I was like, well, I did a little radio like a couple right. of years ago. And he's like, this is ESPN, bro. Like, you get one chance. And I was like, screw it. I had nothing. And uh, he gave me a chance and it just kept going. Same thing happened at Fox College Sports. I got a meeting and all of a sudden I convinced them that in, f- in five years, I'm the only guy that's played or coached in the history of analysts. Yeah. You got to hire me. They hired me. Pac-12, same thing. I was like, you know, I did. I just banged on the door. But on the other side of that has always been somebody who's met me with grace. You know, Kevin Calabro was my first partner. Who yeah. Was the voice Seahawk. of the Sonics. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. for him to teach me the profession, Steve Fiziak was the first guy I broadcast with, who's the Royals guy now. I mean, they met me with grace. And now to for Ted, for to meet with to, to partner with him at a stage in my career where I know I kind of know what I'm doing and, you know, kind of have my stuff together of how I want to celebrate the game and coach the viewer. It, you couldn't ask for anything better. I mean, to me, I'm getting paired. I'm like, I'm like Tim Duncan, he's David Robinson. You yeah. know, like at this stage in our careers, it's it couldn't be something that, that that lights up my world more than being around him. And and it's it's absolutely fascinating because I'll, I'll sit there in a broadcast and I'll just look at him after he says something. I'll just say, damn, that was really good. Mm. You know, to be able to step out of a broadcast and say that to me is when somebody really can impact you. And it's happened with Kevin before, but with Ted, um, my last year has been the most influential one in my life as an on-air personality. And I'm pumped to be with him for the next couple of years. I couldn't be more excited. Well, as we talked about when you interviewed me, you know, I've created this summits module, which, which, you know, is the acronym for really achievement and whatnot. And, and, and the last, the, the summits, the S, the last S is around success, the summit. And it's really about paying it forward. And I think in a situation like you, you have mentors that are reaching back to you and they're paying it forward in their own way in terms of being very generous with their time, sharing the screen. And obviously you guys have a chemistry, so it works, right? Which is awesome. I've been on this kick, even like in meditating of like the idea of giving, you know, like we, you have to give. And it, it goes back to my mom's parents are both Holocaust survivors. They moved to the U.S., start a local market and go bankrupt because they gave away so much to people that were homeless. Hmm. And they didn't care. And these are people that sh- could and maybe should have been angry, you know, Families are murdered and massacred. They went through hell and high water and they were all about love and giving. So for me, I try to do it too when I meet young aspiring on-air broadcasters or producers. Like that's my responsibility as a traveler. I feel like my job is to give away the stories and the, and the concepts that I meet from people, which is why I like the documentaries. And to your exact point, Ted, Kevin, they keep giving. And, uh, and I think the biggest thing that we can do, at least I believe, is I just got to keep receiving and being open to what's coming because I don't want my head to be buried. And all too often in an industry, uh, which is sometimes all about you, you can bury your head. And I've tried to be extremely cognizant to make sure that it is not about me. My job is to receive and be open to everything and celebrate the greatest game in the world and coach the viewer, go coach my mom on cover too. And those are literally the two things that I tell myself and I tell our entire crew before every game. I get on the talk back and I say, yo, everybody, we're calling the natty. Because when I do call the national championship game, it's not going to be a big deal because I would have done it hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. Then I say, our job is to celebrate the game, coach the viewer, let's let it rip. And we go. And that is our mantra. And I believe it. And it's true. And I think that's why if you want any pact of information, ain't two better people that are going to give it to you than Ted or I because I think the way we approach the game. So you're with the Pac-12 Network. Like, How do you see, in, in terms of this particular summit for you, I mean, how do you see this playing out? What would you like to do? I know you just broadcast the, was it the men's or the women's uh, beach volleyball championships? Yeah, that was, that was a blast. Yeah, it was the women's beach uh, Women, championships. Yeah. Do you see yourself you know, being the anchor of NBC, Bob Costas, doing the Olympics? I mean, right. is your, are your sights as wide open to whatever will be will be, or where do you see that? Yeah, I think it's really cool now with the, the media landscape. You know, I think fans, in college football at least, they want uh, experts within their team. You know, they don't want me to come and talk about just the, you know, the first guy on the UCLA defensive line. They want me to talk about the third guy on the defensive line. And I could go there and do that. And that's, I think, a responsibility that we have to fans. But overall, in my career, 
I want to play on the biggest of stages. I mean, mm-hmm. I love that. And the fun part is, is we get to define what those stages are, right? So does that mean sold out Rose Bowl National Championship? Of course, like that's a given. Uh, but it also can mean telling the most intimate stories because Josh Rosen can trust me because I've known him and I work for the Pac-12 Network. And that's the beauty of our network because we do take you two, three, four, five di- layers deep. That to me, I've been able to transition in my mind that that is playing on a huge stage. And as the media circles continue to basically chop down the trees of, well, there's only these two or three places you can work. That's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a wide open landscape and great storytellers are heard and great stories are seen and shared and celebrated. And and that's what I see. You know, I, I was lucky to work at ESPN and Fox early in my career, and those were incredible experiences. Uh, but now I look at the Pac-12 network and it's kind of a frontier in media of, hey, anybody can get anything they want whenever they want it. Mm-hmm. So if you're coming correct and bringing it, that's going to bring you other opportunities in your life. So that's where I'm at in sports. But overall, I'd love to have my own show and my own platform, which is why I do my own podcast, which is why I like the documentary styles, things that I do just to be able to get in and hone in with a live audience, to be able to hone in with someone in a different environment, whether that's on the road, traveling, or in their backyard. I mean, I love those elements. And if I could be the bridge between your story and somebody who's receiving it, I think that's a that's a skill set that I've always continued to try to work on. Yeah, well, I mean, look, at I, I said this at the very beginning, but I think you're 35 now. Right. So, I mean, it's just amazing to me that you've been able to accomplish so much. You know, after I got done playing professional football, I was in that kind of like tailspin of like, what in the hell do I do now? And, you know, yeah, I went through a couple of years of really hard times of just, you know, I know I'm born to do something great and just trying to figure that out and trying to map my way there. And after after playing, you know, at the top of your profession and doing that thing that you talked about growing up as a kid with your three other friends, me doing the same thing in Seattle and actually accomplishing that. And then you're going, okay, is it all downhill from here? Right. Cause you, you, you hit your summit, you hit your peak and, and it's, it's hard for a lot of guys. So, you know, congratulations on that end. So what I want to do right now is transition over a little bit from you, you kind of mentioned this for a minute, but I want to talk about life in a walk. It's a movie. So you're playing football, you get a call from Pete, you come out, you're kind of, you know, should I do the broadcasting thing or am I going to go into coaching? And ultimately it, it turns out to be broadcasting and you've got this great gig going on right now. So where was the inspiration for you to take on this, this movie and explain a little bit about what that, I know it involves you and your dad, but pretty fascinating that you you know put this thing together and it's it's really cool yeah thanks um i think it all started back in fourth grade because in fourth grade it was the first time i had a coach basically you know shit on a dream and it was the first time anybody ever did it for me and it was i remember it viscerally what i was wearing what the gym was like what he said how he said it and basically i wanted to play in the nba and he laughed and he goes yogi's gonna get his nba and that was probably a compliment at the time. But for me, I didn't know what an MBA was. Yeah. And it crushed me. And it turned me into writing. And I've been writing ever since. And if there's one thing that I'd hang my hat on, it would be that. Of like, it's, it's the one thing that comes out of my fingers. I don't plan it. I don't outline it. It just can go. And I love it. It's just therapeutic for me. So I did it when I was coaching. Now, I was lucky to write Pete's book, but I wrote my own while I was doing it. And I say that because when my coaching career ended and I started broadcasting, I got approached by... Uh, ESPN if I wanted to do documentaries. And at the time, Sark so, went to so, so this would be like a 30-30 type Exactly. Yeah. So there's a year, I guess it'd be 2009, it was called the Year of the QB mm-hmm. on ESPN. Yeah. And Jake Locker decided to return for senior year. Yeah. And I just turned down this job. But Sark couldn't have been better about it. We were still boys Washington and all that boy. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. He's at UW. He goes, what do you think about doing a doc on this? Or, you know, they're trying to, this is a team coming off a zero win season. And, uh, I said, yeah, this is kind of cool. So I called my friends at ESPN, uh, Joan Lynch, who was running content development. And I said, I think there's, we have this doc on Jake Locker. Like he, he was projected to be the one or two pick, uh, decides to come back. He turns on all this money, Ferndale, the whole story. And she's like, let's do it. So I go up there and what I start to learn and I start to begin the journey is I transition from writing in pen and paper and computers to writing on the screen. And I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to turn a camera on. I didn't know how to light an interview. I didn't know how to do an interview. I just knew the access. And I, that was the first step for me getting into documentary filmmaking. And mm. I was just a field producer. I would just show up and I'd make the room right. I knew the coaching community so I could make sure the camera guys who knew nothing about the coaching community didn't piss everybody off. You know, they didn't bust into a team meeting. Like they just knew the landscape and the environment. And I was like, this is a skill. 
producing and knowing the intimate elements of college football is a skill. This could get me into doing stories. So I probably do 10, 12, 14 docs like that. And then I get to a place where I am enjoying producing, but I'm not running it. I'm not really writing it. And I said, screw this. I got to do my own story. And at the time I was doing a pilot travel show uh, in New York City. And the crew that I was working with, God bless them. They said, Yogi, we love your iPhone, but do you mind if we just come follow you on your next trip? Like, we'd love to just capture everything with like a nice camera. Mm -hmm. I was like, sure, I'm going to go do this walk with my dad. And they were in, in two seconds. I said, let's go do it. And the backstory of the walk was that I was sitting in my couch one night in this apartment where we're at right now. And I was watching a movie on TV, and it was about this place in Spain, Portugal, Paris, or France, uh, called the Camino de Santiago, which is his famous walk. And it hit me between the eyes that I had never dealt with the fact that our dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2009. Hmm. Mind you, 2009 was also the year I left coaching. It was the year that I was made sure that it was about me, and I wanted to figure my life out. And hmm. I didn't even flinch when he was sick. I was like, oh, he's fine. It's my dad. He's good. And it all rushed back to me, literally like a massive huge wave like a tsunami almost and i'm bawling and i'm crying and i'm sitting there like i never dealt with this yeah i got a lot of shit i gotta ask him and my friends were losing parents at the time and they learned more about them at the celebration of their life than they did in real life so i flew to new york literally two days later and i said dad let's go for a walk and he said sure where do you want to go and i gave him a plane ticket and i said if you want to go meet me in madrid in two weeks we're gonna walk the Camino to santiago Hmm. and how long was that it was 14 days Okay. He didn't know about a camera crew. He didn't know shit. Yeah. He was just like, of course I'm in. Now, he and I had traveled to India before for a month. So we, we've got a great vibe. We have an awesome relationship. So he was thinking just another trip. Yeah. And we show up and there's two guys and us. And uh, we document the whole thing. Hmm. Come home, not sure what's going to be, uh, and start to just go to work. And for me, the beautiful element of the walk was that every single day I'd ask him about a different decade in his life. And that's how I organized the film in my mind. And what I learned about him is that anytime he'd gone through anything, and you learn this in the film, whether it was losing, uh, you know, he and my mom lost twins, whether it's losing his own father, whether it was losing a job, he always walked. Hmm. And for me, anytime somebody shit on my dream or anytime that I was told I wasn't good enough to play or anytime that I struggled in a relationship, I always walked, which is why I leaned into your story about walking around Santa Monica so much. We start our conversation on my podcast. But my point is that, Man is made to move. And our dad says that very eloquently in the film. And you move through things. And we move through that together. And it changed my life to this day, I think, is the the most impactful thing I've ever gone through. When I came home and made it into a film, all I wanted was him to enjoy it. And what happened was is that the world enjoyed it and it exploded. And I didn't know what would happen at the time. I was pumped about it, but it really, I didn't even care because it wasn't about that. It was so much about this intimate relationship. Can I capture this guy? And what I've learned and been so appreciative of since then is that it has nudged people across the globe on airplanes, wherever, to go ask people that matter to them important questions. And where can you find this this film? Yeah, it's pretty much everywhere but Netflix, Uh, but Amazon, uh, Google, uh, it's on YouTube. You have to pay for it. Uh, It's on iTunes. Uh, it's on Hulu. It's it's on on demand on your cable provider. Yeah, It's, it's pretty much everywhere. What a great experience. You know, it was a life changer, man. It was a absolute life changer because we go so fast sometimes, specifically out here. And we we don't sometimes ask the questions that matter. And I still trip out about it. I mean, the tagline of the movie is, I never want to say the sentence, I wish I spent more time with my dad. Hmm. And I dropped him off at the airport after we screened it all across the country. And I broke down because I realized that the tagline was kind of BS because I'm always going to say, I wish I spent more time with my dad. Sure, But at least it got me thinking down that road and... uh it changed me. It's fun to hear from people. I hear from people probably every day who see it all across the globe. And uh, it's really fun because, again, you go back to what are you supposed to do in this world? You're supposed to give and leave with nothing. And uh, that story, if that can nudge one person to ask their dad or their mom or their loved one a question, then we did our job. And I think it's doing it, man. Your dad is still with us? Yeah, yeah. He's oh, actually flying awesome. to L.A. tomorrow. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Wait. I lost my dad five years ago. And it's, you know, I ask that question all the time. I think about him all the time. And you know, I wish he was back. Great guy, right? And um, you're right. A lot of times you don't get to say what you really feel until, you know, they, they pass. And all of a sudden, everybody shows up to talk about what a great guy he was, that everybody should have been saying those things while he was around. Yeah. Right? You know, you're a parent, so I'd be curious your take on it. But I always look at parents and I'm like, okay, the, a job fundamentally is to to raise a child, to educate, to protect, to teach. 
very rarely is to share your own story. And I think there's a gracefulness that's required there because I'm in the high school quarterback space a lot when I, I see parents sometimes share, oversharing their story and living vicariously through their kid. Mm-hmm. I think there's a healthy balance there of letting your kid know who, who their parent is because we want to learn about the people closest to us. And to me, that's been a real fun study to observe as this thing's kind of gone on. As we talked about when you interviewed me is I went through a rough time. I got divorced, right? And it was awful. It's something that I never planned on. I couldn't imagine 24 years, but a lot of my life was buried in the garage, right? And one of the things I've done at my place in Hermosa Beach is completely decorated with lifetime memories and lifetime memories, not just of me and my accomplishments, but of my kids and, you know, things that I've been. So every single time I got a few people over last night, Jim Moore and other people like that, and the house tells a story and it opens up a conversation. And my, my daughter brought some of her SC, Claudette, as you know, brought some of her friends over and they were all going around looking at every single picture and seeing Claudette in Mexico and Hawaii and you know, so it's just really living that that story, and they're asking questions about me, and you know, based on other things that they saw. So it wasn't a abstract photo of a of a bird or something, which is cool. But I don't know. I, I think we tend to run so fast, as you say, that you don't take a time out to really think about where you've been and what you want to accomplish. Yeah, we we started this game in our house. Uh, whenever we sit down for dinner as a family, which doesn't happen, maybe twice a year, but you ha- everyone has to ask a question they don't know the answer to. And it turns into like a two-hour discussion. Sure. Because it's like, oh, shit. And then it spins to the next question, the next thing, and the next thing. And I I think you're right. I'm a totally believer now of being in the story world for almost a decade of like life is a all about story. You know, everything. And it it doesn't mean like Hollywood cheesy story, shyster. Like, no, no, no. Everyone has one. Everyone lives one. And I think it's really important to ask them. And I, I do this exercise when I get on a plane sometimes, or really a lot of the time, where I, I force myself to ask the person I'm sitting next to their story. And it's really fun because the higher you get in class, right? I, I did a job where I was flown first class a couple of weeks ago. Very rarely do that. And nobody talked. And I was blown away. I was like, here we are in like the sweetest spot. Yeah. And we're not talking. But when I'm in coach and I'm next to you, we are boys. We are homies. And like by the end of it, we're exchanging emails. And I thought it was a really unique study of like, okay, well, what if we give ourselves that subtle challenge of, okay, you have to connect with one person a day. Mm-hmm. Like you have to. And it has to be somebody you've never met before. And it could be in line at the grocery store or walking down the beach. And you don't have to ask them for their number or their last name or their first name, but just connect. And I think that that's what we seek. And I, and I just did this study on connection. And I think that when you look at the 8 billion people on the planet, the amount of people that are on Facebook, the amount of people that are sharing a post, we all seek that. You know, in an era where we can connect in an instant, we're as disconnected as we've ever been. And uh, to me, that's a life mission of at least having that conversation to make sure we do it. I also think there's a mental shift um, for me. And I'm, I'm, I'm no, you know, the listeners can't see this, but I've got this book, um, my journal that I, I've got next to the table. And in the back, it's got do's and don'ts and goals and everything else. But through here, you know, one of the things that I try to do is be thankful for for everyone, be grateful and appreciative. And I think when you go into that mindset, it opens you up to those types of things. Otherwise, you flip back to the other part of it, which is this is all about me, right? Yeah. And it's why I, I think I stay connected to the coaching community so much because you mentioned Coach Moore, what I love about him. And we did a doc on him all year. And the fun part about docs is people are mic'd up and they forget they're mic'd up. So you hear them, you hear their truth, you hear exactly who they are and what they're about. You know, it's like when you're on the mountain, when it gets really hard, you're your purest form. Yeah. And what I loved about him is that he's, he's really about giving back to young men that need him in their lives. Yeah. You know, so it's about that connection, like truly in every sense of it. And like on one hand, yes, I left coaching, but I truly say it before every broadcast, my job is to coach the viewer. So to do that, I got to know how he thinks. I don't know how his quarterbacks coach thinks. I got to know how the freshman thinks. I got to know how mom and dad thinks. So there's this whole idea that's still baked in that idea of being like the coach at Pitt when I was coaching Larry Fitz on how to run a post route or coaching at SC and, you know, working with Mark Sanchez or, or just coaching a viewer. I, I don't think that ever leaves. It's just the, the muse has changed. Uh, but the core, I think, of a coach or as a jock like you and I share it never goes away. Yep. You want to compete at the highest level. You you have huge standards for everyone that you're hiking with or climbing with or broadcasting with. And you want it in return. You want to get coached hard. And I, I think that's things that just kind of, you know, they, they carry with you no matter if you're making breakfast or if you're calling a game, if you're hiking Denali. Sure. And 
all those things got revealed when I just got back from Denali too. So as we as we start to close here, follow up question to your movie. Do you have another one coming out? Yeah, it's been fun. I just got into like the short film world, mm-hmm. which to me has been. Uh, and what, what does that mean? Short film is five minutes, yeah, two minutes, anywhere from like three to twenty minutes. Okay, and I don't know if it's a, it's a if it's like a response to our short attention spans. I, I don't know what it is, but I've, I've I've really had a lot of fun with it. I did one on inauguration day, and I just asked people around L.A. what it means to be human, and it did pretty well. And then I went to Israel a couple of weeks ago and asked people, what does it mean to love? Yeah. And while I was there, I got embedded in their football team or their football league. They, I saw yeah, that. It's awesome. So yeah. we created a doc series called uh, We All Speak Ball. Yeah. Um, so those two things are out now. They just came out and, they, and they're growing every day, which is kind of fun to watch it kind of evolve. And again, online. you can, uh, iTunes. Uh, well, they're all free. I put all them free. all on YouTube okay. or at yogiroth.com. You can get them all there. And then uh, I, I'm almost done with a new film called The Cape, which you'll love. We screened it yesterday, actually. Mm. Um, it's about uh, sailing around South America in Cape Horn. Wow. And when I was a kid, I got a journal. I was given at eight years old, and it was about this guy whose life was kind of falling apart, and he got a job on a boat. And he sailed around Cape Horn, which is known as Sailor's Graveyard, you know, the tip of South America, the most deadly sea in the world. Mm. And he'd write about it and write about it. And it was 1857 and 1858. And here I am at eight years old reading this thing, and it happens to be our great, great, great grandfather. Hmm. So I've been obsessed with this part of the world since I was a kid. Finally, three years ago, I went and sailed it, filmed it, came back. We're almost done with the film now, and I hope we start to screen it at festivals in uh, January, February. Yeah, that that is just amazing. So you've got a podcast called Life Without Limits, right? Yes. And it kind of intertwines a little bit with finding your summit, right? Right. And so, you know, we've talked about a lot of things from coaching to growing up to being grounded to your parents, the way they raised you to filmmaking. In terms of your summit, where do you see yourself at this stage of your career? I think I'm just getting warmed up. You know, I have this this analogy I've been using lately where like, uh, I think that guys like you and I, we really enjoyed getting our hands dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, you you do obviously your hand, look at your hands now, right? You've been climbing, you, you clearly they get dirty. But the idea to me is that like when you, achieve a certain level in a career or in a life like you can get comfortable and to me it's i always love walking in santa monica because i listen to the street performers yep. or walking in venice and i see people just fighting and clawing and scratching yeah. and they're dirty and i remember when i was you know making 15 grand just fighting my ass off to just get any hit on tv can somebody i'm begging somebody to put me on or i'll do it for free screw it and just live in however you got to live to me I, I i still feel that guy and I know that I'm not, and I know that uh, you know I've achieved some cool things, but in terms of the summit, I really enjoy digging in, yep. and I think that's important. Whether I'm digging into high school football recruits for the Elite Eleven, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, or if that is broadcasting, and I don't know if you lose that. I think you have to adjust, and for me, a big challenge is to adjust my life so I'm not always just competing in that regard. I'm competing in my relationships. I'm competing to create some free time for my life. Like I'm competing in other areas. But with the same rigor, the same focus, the same, you know, hopeful grace, the same mindfulness uh, that I did when I was fighting for a roster spot. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I don't, I don't, I've never really think about, have I arrived? I know I've done cool stuff and I, and I get all that, but I really think I'm just getting going and I enjoy that mindset because it keeps me sharp and uh, it keeps me working and, I'm, and I don't lay back, but I know how to relax and I know how to not work. 20 hour days anymore like i know how to strategically do it better but i'll be honest man i don't i, I don't think i've done anything i think i'm just getting going yeah and they, they talk about always you know it's all part of the journey right it's yeah. not necessarily the summit it's part of the journey you know not too much different than when you're talking about you won defensive player of the year in this county or in your state and your mom pointed out that there's 49 other states out there too so really in the big scheme of things there's a long way to go and there's always more to accomplish that's why i love to travel i went to iceland after the season for the sole element of i wanted to feel tiny and in yeah. Iceland, it's like Mars. You got to go. You feel like you're just in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And it was really cool. And and I, the idea of the journey, I, I always go back to uh, for the first times I met Coach Mora and interviewed him. He talked about the Rose Bowl, and he goes, you know, a lot of times, and he was talking to his team. He's like, a lot of times you don't really remember the Rose Bowl. You remember the game that got you there. And I thought that was really cool. Mm-hmm. And I think back on my coaching career, and I coached in four Rose Bowls, and I can remember the game that got us there a lot. You know, of course, the pageantry of the game is great, but I do think that you remember the, the journey so much so when our film ended, Life in a Walk, the final night when we picture locked it and it was done, I cried the whole way home because I was like, now it's going to be about the promotion of this film. 
and I'm not going to be in the heart and the, and the, and the fire of the making and the creation of it. Like now it's time to celebrate it. And that was a tar- hard transition for me to make, which probably goes back to being a kid with a chip on his shoulder in Pennsylvania. If I was psychoanalyzed, but I'm okay with that. If that's my truth, you know? Yeah. Well, look, I think wrapping this, this up and this has been a great interview. It's just, and one of the reasons why I want to start with you is just because, you know, you're a guy with deep emotion, a deep thinker. I think you are beyond your years for most guys at your age because they're out pursuing things that really don't matter. I go back and I think about what your mom named you. You know, there's importance in your name. So it made you from the time you were a little kid to really think about importance and there's history and those things mean something. It's just not, you know, another name when you walk down the street. You know, it's who you are and what your background is and what, what your parents and your heritage is all about. And um, I think, you know, taking timeouts, walking, as you talked about, you know, walking with your dad, walking on your own, meditating, these are all things that matter. And for people who don't and just rush through life, you know, I really think that they're missing out. It's amazing the amount of, of serenity that I find when I get into the mountains. And, you know, there's no media, there's no cell phones, there's nothing. And uh, in this case, my case, this last week on Denali, I was stuck in a tent for five days. And you're going, what do you do for five days? And it was just a great opportunity to sit and write and get you very clear on thoughts and things that matter to you in life and how you can make an impact. Yeah. I mean, I, I wish there was, you were filmed for five days. Like I can see it, you know, like <laughs> I could see the movie. Uh, it seems so cinematic and, and beautiful. And yeah, man, you're, you're spot on. And, and you know, it's fun to talk to the coaches that in, in their, or high level executives that are really successful. They talk about kind of like, it's almost like the space between the notes. You know, so I had a note, bing, before I hit the next one, there's this cool space. And the ones that can maximize that break, that space, that five minutes or five hours or five days, that's when I think the growth occurs before I hit the boom in the next note. And I learned that from Pete. And as I watch coaches in the Pac-12 specifically and, and guys I know around the country, the ones that can do that or the ones that look at the world a little differently. You know, Jim's great at it. You know, one of the most intense people I've ever been around, but nothing's ever too big because he's been through the fires before. Mm-hmm. And to me, that resonates with his teams. You, you were hiking in Denali in five days. I highly doubt things, something is going to be too big for you or too intense for you when your life is a big, strong gust of wind away from taking a turn. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that traveling and seeing the globe does that, which is why I always push young kids and your daughter to see the globe, see the world, you know, learn, get uncomfortable, get in places you don't you know, have a clue about. And it's why I do it as a meditative exercise every year is I'm going to go to Europe in a, in a week. I'm just going to get lost. Yeah. And so awesome. It's going to be dope. And I'll feel like I'm 10 again playing basketball. Yeah. You know? Well, like you said, I mean, there's, there's, you, you find out that people are people and cultures aren't that different, really. It's governments. And, um, it just puts a whole new perspective on learning from others, you know, who do things slightly different. It's awesome. Yeah. Where can they find you? I'm easy. Um, Yogi Roth on pretty much all media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, yogiroth.com, um, all my contacts. And I'm, I'm really easy to reach and, and I enjoy that part of it because you got to take the good with the bad. And, and like, your podcast know, is Life, Life Without, Without Limits. Limits. Yeah. yeah. And you're probably on your hundredth episode or something now. We're going you're good. Uh, 40, 45, 46. The yeah. next couple are going to be really cool. The last one I did, you got to make sure you send to your daughter. It's really cool. It's this woman who was a singer and a dancer, did all these things. And then got a corporate job and then became a mom and never let go of her artisan soul. And it came back out and now she's the lead singer of a band. And it's really cool to Mm. hear how she stayed creative, even if it wasn't broadcast to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, listen, I totally appreciate it. It's been a blessing for me to kick this thing off with you. And um, we'll just keep the machine rolling. Hey, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. If you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts. It takes a little more to make a champion. So make it happen. Thank you. Bye.